Hello, my name is Craig. Welcome to this documentary. It is about the New Zealand Sign Language Act. We will be looking at how the political, social and legal area affects the deaf community. Just, just from the outside looking in, I would say the New Zealand Sign Language Act was a real breakthrough for, for deaf people in particular, but Support. for the movement generally, because there's a recognition that, that deaf people have a right to be heard and a right to, to express what they're saying. about sign language. It's easy for a person to recognize a language. Okay. That's a language. But it's different to say is that language the same as the main language, the spoken language. You know what I mean? So you can say, yeah, that's a language, but it's the language only deaf people use. Mm. <laughs> See what I mean? It's not you can recognise a language, but that in itself doesn't mean anything. So it doesn't recognise deaf culture. A local deaf woman, Jackie, who assisted in a high school, has expressed disappointment of the NZS Cell Act shortcomings. All deaf people thought it was great that it was proved, approved, but we didn't realise that it was only for justice and the police, and that was it. So you're meaning it's very limited. Yes, Lim yes, limited. Like for instance, a lot of deaf people end up in prison. And, and that's because they don't get a fair trial because they cannot, because they don't have interpreters. Now they have the law on their side to demand interpreters so that their stories can be heard before the law. David explains this idea in more detail. Uh, the law means when it's law, it means that uh, in a court, if a deaf person was in the court, they had a right to an interpreter. And they don't have to say anything without an interpreter. So that's, that's law. But it's the only place where it's law. There's an interpreter. Mm -hmm. So the Sign Language Act recognised sign language as probably as a language deaf people use, okay? Uh -huh. So, it didn't put sign language on the same level as English or Māori. Not on the same level. language that deaf people use, 
people can say it's just a tool, a disabled tool, like Braille. Mm -hmm. There's no culture involved in that. It's just a tool. Is further, it is explained further. That takes the focus away from the deaf community. Take the focus. What takes the focus away from the deaf community? Interpreters. Interpreters take the focus away from the deaf community. They do. Take the focus of what away from the deaf community? Public focus. The public focus. Uh, so, when we saw the earthquakes in Christchurch, mm -hmm. we saw an interpreter. But we didn't see any dip. Uh, okay. When there's news on TV, there's an interpreter. Um, so, with the focus on interpreting, it's shown, that's another way of showing that sign language is a tool uh, for access. We will see that from a disability perspective, which believes that the issue of access should be in high priority. So, if 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 the if the powers that be are really um, genuine about New Zealand sign, they will have all um, all news, all current affairs, all programs they make signed in sign on TV. They will also be putting, having a big effort into training interpreters. They will have a big effort into, um, and interpreters need to be freely available. Then we see that disability lecturer and deaf community worker agree on one thing, the need for a language nest. And into having the equivalent of language nests for um, deaf people, they would have a community have had a model which they could have had a look at, but they didn't. You will a model a model of what to do with your language. You see, like for example, you mean no structure, no language nest. That's what we're saying. That's it. So with. The Kohanga Reo, the Māori language, uh, education started, and uh, they set up these Kohanga Reo groups in 1981 in Wellington, okay. and they were two hours. Kohanga Reo, hey, Kohanga Reo, K O H. U N G A, Kohanga Rao. Yeah, they were like, okay. they were language groups, uh -huh. and they operated on the Marae, different Marae, eh? so they were teaching Maori language to kids okay. outside the school system, not in the school, out. And they did that, they set up these like language nets, Kohanga Rao, on their own Marae. Started in Wellington and it spread a bit. It's a shame that deaf people didn't do this. That's it. Because the hearing people come and say, we'll do this for you. No, no, no. 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 Because seven years. <laughs> Seven 
David discusses the community's lack of political drive. The process was one way of, of mobilising, getting de together on something, but Mobilising. 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 Moving. Getting the, getting the communities together to go to Parliament no. to lobby for the Act, eh? But the mobilisation sort of, once it went to Parliament, it just sort of stopped. There was no follow-up. There no follow-up. So the, the real responsibilities are to the deaf community, but they haven't done it. They haven't. They haven't. The deaf community. It's not. It's just that in the past they had their priorities a little bit jumbled. The deaf communities in the past tended to focus on sports mm. and social activities. They didn't really have a political. Uh, Mind God, effect. God, that's it. And so... Didn't have a political aim. No. And, and a lot of them still don't. Mm. They don't. Mm. Uh, so, um, that, that would be one factor why the Sign Language Act was so narrow. Because, basically, at the time, a lot of people must have thought, let's get this recognised, and that's all we need to do. And yet, Jackie recalled her disappointment with the lack of her professional opinion. And as a native signer from the school board, meeting when selecting a potential hearing staff to assist deaf students in school. I wasn't happy, I wasn't satisfied with this person communicating. They didn't have very good signing skills. And the other communicators weren't happy either. And they said that they hadn't known, but it was the boss that had decided that. They should ask first, um, so that I'm able to decide whether that person has adequate signing skills. It is interesting to see what David says about management of sign language. Oh, they're trying to make it available in the classroom. They like to make it available in the classroom. Yeah. As a subject, but I think that's good. But it's got to be, it's got to be managed by the deaf, not the education people, and not the school, not the school. But the school has been having the power that's over it. deaf people. That's it. Jackie recalls another disappointment that hearing people decided to start a business in teaching sign language. So, for example, I teach people sign language and then they go and set up their own business. That's not really fair. They should ask me first. They should ask me first if they sh can do that because first and foremost it should be a deaf person, a deaf tutor teaching sign language. It would be better to have a deaf tutor. If I'm deaf, not very, not very happy. Having people to have their own sign language class. Yeah, that's it. And patient student from a deaf teacher 
through a hearing teacher. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Mm. I feel, um, but that's because that's happening because uh, sort of there's no leadership, there's no authority on sign language. So you've got. Uh. Martin offers a more optimistic opinion of how disability rights can help deaf people push for change. With a working knowledge of the UN Convention on Disabled Rights, would have Kohanga Reos, have New Zealand Sign Language. Martin languages. elaborates on the reason to go a disability rights route, how UN Convention for Rights for People that? with how Disabilities. How can the Sign Language Act, how can that encourage the creation of, say, a language nest? Well, it's 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 exactly the same as what the, New, the the United Nations conventions on the rights of persons with disability. We've got a law there now. We've got a convention we've signed. New Zealand signed up to. It's ratified it. It's up to us disabled people to make sure it works. So we've got to get out on the streets. We've got to be knocking on doors. We've got to be pushing the politicians, saying the the UN convention does this. Now, what the deaf community needs to be saying is we've got this law, the New Zealand Sign Language Act, which makes us an of, of the third official language. Why are we not having more resources put into making that act work for us, for the deaf community? For it to work for the deaf community, we need the equivalent of kohanga reos for New Zealand Sign Language. We need to train families, we need to train deaf people, we need to teach them that sign and about, we need to teach them about the deaf culture, we need to teach them that. Next he reasons that hearing society doesn't as he explains the scope sign language, of the act, as it is a, a consequence language, on the way sign language is perceived in the mainstream society further. and its institutions. As he explains the scope of the act, it is a consequence on the way sign language is perceived in the mainstream society and its institutions. They can't talk the language and other people can't communicate with them. But B, because straight out disabilism. We live in a disabling society. The rest of society don't see deaf people as belonging to a linguistic minority culture. They just see them as being deaf and disabled. And, and I think deaf people, you've got to give them credit for hanging on in there and saying we're a, a minority, a linguistic minority culture. Good on them for that. But also they've got to have, they've got to be pragmatic, politically pragmatic. They've got to get real about this. They've got to start naming deafness or we live in a, um, a hearingness world where to be here to be able to hear is to be valid you know it's uh, and They've got to challenge the hegemonic hearingness, the hearingness world. Yeah, the the the, and you can't challenge it when you're hiding yourself away in your deaf clubs, mate.
uh, the deaf taking ownership of their language. Deaf and people have ownership of the language. Yeah, the deaf have to have ownership of the language. It's their, their language and they have to own it. And they have to be prepared to lobby and set up. Set up what? Language nests. Language nests. Language nests. Where um, sign language can be developed. Um, this means that you've got to train people who have become professional um, so that you, people know that what's going to happen in that language nest is, is, is really good practice. So we're looking for best teaching practice. And there's many, many deaf out there who, who could do that. There's many deaf people out there who can do that. They can do that. But they need to be paid for their skills. They need to be... That deaf people aren't doing it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, ah... Uh, but... Ah... Uh, the question is exactly what is it doing? Yeah, what is it doing? Yeah. 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 Uh, you see, we're looking at the disabled path mm -hmm. that it's going down. Mm -hmm. We're having these things called access centres. So you've got relay services, mm -hmm. uh, video, video relay services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But culturally, that's not right. Oh, why is that? Because we need face to face. Hello. Here at the ground floor upstairs, there is an office deaf Aotearoa. I asked if they would talk about the New Zealand Sign Language Act. No, they declined. But to change the perception of the language, you have to have a strong local community. But you have to have the basic uh, community structures to do that. Mm. But if you're culturally aware, you should become politically aware as well. for the language in this area. And the deaf community in Hawke's Bay will be responsible for Hawke's Bay. Same in Taranaki and Dunedin. And those, all those small areas, it'll be the local deaf community who will be responsible. When I was making this documentary, I've been thinking for a long time, pondering. So I came to a conclusion and thought, how deaf do own sign language? If deaf people set up a commission or board? So, I asked Jackie. The commission, what do you think about that?
I don't know what you mean. So if you have a sign language commission, and for example, hearing people want to learn sign language and st set up their own business, they would need to uh, ask deaf people's permission first. Do you think? Do you agree with that or not? Well, that's hard. And about ownership rights of sign language, and the New Zealand Sign Language Act. You're talking about hearing people taking uh, over. Mm. This is really clear deaf people in the community like this idea of the commission. This is the same, the council. The council for what? For the sign language authority. But David reminds us that if we are going to take the move, to take back the control of the language, then we will have to face a lot of hard work. That's a big challenge.